My name is Inigo Montoya. You kill my functor. Prepare to die. Welcome to a Programming Languages virtual meetup post-recording. My name is Connor Hoekstra, and in today's video, we're going to be covering Chapter 5 of Category Theory for Programmers by Bartosz Maluski, which is entitled Products and Co-Products. Before we look at the table of contents, I wanted to highlight a visual graphic from a talk called Category Theory as a Tool of Thought. And towards the end of the talk, I'll put a link in the description down below if you want to check it out. Uh, was this graphic, which I thought is pretty cool. It, it sort of maps out all of, or not all of, but a lot of the main concepts from category theory. So in chapter three, we covered monoid. In chapter four, we covered the Kleisley category and writer. And in chapter five, we're going to be covering product sum, terminal object, initial object, and duality. So every chapter where we end up covering something from this graphic, I will probably give an update because I think it's pretty cool. With that out of the way, let us take a look at the table of contents. So for chapter five, products and co-products, we have seven main sections, excluding the challenges and bibliography section. And those are initial object, terminal object, duality, isomorphisms, products, co-product, and asymmetry. And what we're going to do for this uh, post recording is just to give a very brief summary by basically covering uh, the main point uh, without going into too much explanation from each one of these sections. And I highly recommend that you go and watch Bartosz Maluski's three lectures that correspond to Chapter 5 and this sort of uh, post-recording slash summary video because it, I will not do uh, justice to um, the explanations that Bartosz gives, which I think are fantastic. So this will be a video on the, sh the shorter side just to give you a flavor of what you would be learning if you read through this and watched the corresponding lectures. So with that said, let's hop into it. From the initial object subsection, the main point is the following. The initial object is the object that has one and only one morphism going to any object in the category. Um, I watched another talk, which I can't remember off the top of my head, but I will link it in the description as well, that had a really good example of uh, visualizing initial objects and terminal objects in a DAG, a directed acyclic graph. So if you think of a directed acyclic graph where one node um, is basically just has outgoing arrows to every other node that would qualify as an initial object and on the flip side a terminal object so this is the second sub uh, section the terminal object is the object with one and only one morphism coming to it from any object in the category so this is the flip side so imagine you have a directed acyclic graph with a node at the end where it has no arrows uh, or edges going out from that node and only arrows coming into it from every node in the graph. That would be uh, qualify as a terminal object. And if you define your arrow to be reachability, you don't actually have to explicitly have the edges uh, directly pointing towards that node. As long as every node is reachable, um, can reach that final node, that makes it a terminal node. So that brings us to the third subsection on duality, which reads, you can't help but notice the symmetry between the way we define the initial object and the terminal object. The only difference between the two was the direction of morphisms, aka arrows. It turns out that for any category C, we can define the opposite category C op just by reversing all the arrows. And in the lectures, Bartaj makes a statement at one point uh, where he says, uh, we probably could have actually called initial the initial object uh, co-terminal or the terminal object co-initial, um, but for some reasons, um, you know, naming reasons, they decided to go with initial and terminal. But for a lot of things, for instance, uh, product, co-product, monad, co-monad, etc., um, the dual object is just prefixed with a co, which is good to know. Moving on to the fourth subsection, which is on isomorphisms. This is the part of the text that defines an isomorphism. So it reads, mathematically, it means that there is a mapping from object A to object B, and there is a mapping from object B back to object A, and they are the inverse of each other. In category theory, we replace mappings with morphisms, and isomorphism is an invertible morphism, or a pair of morphisms, one being the inverse of the other. And shortly after this, uh, <laughs> this is one of the statements, um, now let's forget about sets and define a product of two objects in any category using the same universal construction. Such a product doesn't always exist, but when it does, it is unique up to unique isomorphism. Um, and I was pretty confused by this statement. This chapter in general, I would say, is by far the most difficult to parse compared to the previous four. Um, but if you read back into the uh, earlier in the text, it actually defines what a unique isomorphism is um, when it says, when I said that the initial slash terminal object was unique up to isomorphism, I meant that any two initial terminal 
initial slash terminal objects are isomorphic. So that means if you just have uh, two initial objects, they have to be um, isomorphic. Uh, and there's a great blog article that I'm going to link when we get to the challenges of this chapter that goes into this uh, like step by step with a lot of detail mapping out how this actually works, um, which I found really, really useful in understanding this because at first it, it is sort of uh, a lot of new words that are being added to your lexicon and trying to parse what, exactly what this means is, is difficult. And then we get to the product and coproduct subsection. So the two main points from these sections are a product of two objects A and B is the object C equipped with two projections such that for any other object C prime equipped with two projections, there is a unique morphism M from C prime to C that factorizes those projections. So this is a uh, mouthful, but it basically means that you've got... Um, you can think of the example, the concrete example that they, that uh, Bartage mentions both in the lectures and in the book is uh, a pair. So in Haskell, you can just think of this as a two-tuple in a language like C++. You can think of this as a std pair of two elements. And we have morphisms, aka functions, for getting the two elements of the pair out. So in C++, that's your dot first and dot second. In uh, Haskell, that's your FST and SND um, functions. And for coproduct, it says a coproduct of two objects A and B is the object C equipped with two injections such that for any other object C prime equipped with two injections, there is a unique morphism M from C to C prime that factorizes those injections. So this is basically what they've said. It is the dual object uh, with respect to product. And instead of them having sort of a logical and in between the elements, you have a logical or. Um, so the examples that they show in the book are, um, they vary, but basically the general category you can think of is, is for some types. So when like uh, a Boolean is a good example of this, you either have true or false. Um, you can't have a Boolean with both uh, a true and false value at the same time. It's either one or the other. And with this, I believe it brings us to our challenges. So we're going to cover uh, three of, I believe there were eight challenges, but there are solutions to all of these in the GitHub repo, which will be linked in the description down below if you'd like to check out solutions to all of them. So challenge number one, show that the terminal object is unique up to unique isomorphism. So this is actually covered in the book. They show that sort of a verbal proof for initial, um, and you can basically just flip the words around for terminal. But uh, this is where I'm going to link the blog that I mentioned earlier. It's uh, from this blog called Status Failed, and the title of it um, aptly is What Does Unique Up To Isomorphism Really Mean? And then it goes on to explain um, what unique up to unique isomorphism also means. Um, and they go through this in a lot of detail. It's a fantastic article. I highly recommend. And um, this is, you know, some of the diagrams that there's an analog of this in the uh, chapter five in Bartosz's book. Um, so it, it maps one to one for a lot of the concept, concepts, it just goes uh, into more detail in this blog. So uh, I highly recommend um, checking this blog out. This takes us to challenge number four and number five, which were my favorite challenges because it's basically asking you to implement uh, some code. So uh, challenge number four is implement the equivalent of Haskell either as a generic type in your favorite language other than Haskell, and then show that either is a better co-product then int equipped with the two injections that I've left off the screen. But essentially what it uh, consists of is just uh, writing the function that can extract out uh, your either left or your right um, element, which is being stored in your either type. So I did this in my favorite language, which I'm sure uh, some of the repeat watchers will know is APL. And in APL, we don't really have facilities for type design, but you can sort of get the uh, gist of it um, by just defining free functions. Um, and so we're borrowing the function names from the Haskell either type. So left and right is for basically constructing your either type. Um, the one, it's basically a pair of elements. So uh, the comma is catenation. This is identity. So it's going to take one argument and store it here. And then for left, it's basically tagging it. The first element in our pair is a one or a two, indicating that we have a left or a right. Um, and then our next two functions are is left and is right, which bas basically just checks is the first element, so this horseshoe here gets you the first, and it checks whether it's equal to one or equal to two. And left corresponds to one, right corresponds to two, therefore um, this will return you either one or zero, representing true or false, um, based on uh, the either type, quote unquote, that you pass to your is left or is right predicates. And then once we have this, we can 
define our from left and from right functions, which basically is just a conditional operation inside, which is going to check um, if you're calling from left, if you are a left, aka calling is left on your argument, then grabbing the last element of your pair, which is um, you get you can get a multiple ways, but the way we're doing it is reversing and then uh, taking the first. So because our value is stored as the last element of our pair. If we reverse it, it's now the first element. And then if we use first, it gets us the first element from it. So this looks identical for both from left and from right. We're just calling the different is left and is right functions here. And if this fails, we're just going to um, error out with a fail message. And once we have this, we can write some test code. So here we've got um, an either that has a left with a value of 42 and then either with a right uh, with a value of 1729. And then if we check is left is right, we get true true. If we get from left and from right uh, with the corresponding left and rights, we get 42 and 1729. And if we swap them so that we're trying to call from left on a right, we just get uh, two fail messages. And in order to answer question number five, as I mentioned, we just basically need to provide a function that is going to do the sort of uh, factorization, if you will, from um, M. So these are the equivalents of the I and J functions that I left off the screen um, that were defined in C++. So I is just identity and J is checking whether your uh, input is uh, equal to zero or not. And we can do this in a single method called M where we're just checking if it's left, then we call from left. Otherwise, uh, we call from right and then check whether it's equal, uh, not equal to zero. And because we can do this in a single function, it makes it a better fit. And that is all I have to say for chapter five. Other than uh, repeating what I said earlier, I highly recommend there will be three Bartosz Maluski lectures uh, linked in the description on top of the two other category theory talks and the blog link. Um, all the links will be in the, in the description down below. But um, as always, Bartage's lectures are fantastic. He walks you in detail through sort of the uh, visual representations of um, the product and co-product with the sort of projection functions and the factorization M. Um, it's all a bit hairy, but uh, Bartage does a great job walking you through it. And I highly, I can't recommend these videos enough. With that said, thanks for watching. I hope you learned something and I hope to see you in the next video.